Hello, historians. We're going to take a quick dive into um, the Revolutionary War. I'm going to I'm going to skim the information. And as I'm doing this, the reason why I've recorded myself is so that you can pause me and work with a partner and then add the main events uh, to this timeline. You can see 1775 here. So you'll go in chronological order all the way up to 1800. I'm going to talk about um, 1810. So use arrows and put everything in chronological order. So in order from 1775 all the way through 1800. Um, and arrows, and then you can write little jot notes up and, and below of your timeline. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, it's, I think, very, very interesting history. Um, and I'm not going to give it the justice it really deserves uh, simply for the sake of time. But if you ever have a chance to learn more about the American Revolutionary War, you should go for it. Um, so uh, let's just jump into it. Americans win. I know that surprised you. Um, so let's talk about when the war begins. Let's see if I can get my computer to work with me. It's broken. There we go. <laughs> so at the beginning of the American Revolutionary War, uh, it seemed like Britain had all the advantages. They were the leaders in manufacturing. They produced more ships, more weapons than colonists. They had an established government, and the colonists were starting from scratch. Um, the Colonist Continental Congress, they struggled to pay for the war. They didn't have authority to collect taxes. So Congress and states, they just printed paper money. And you can see here examples of paper money. And so this produced inflation that damaged the economy. Continental soldiers were hungry and cold. British troops were well-trained and they had plenty of supplies. And so in the beginning, the odds seemed very slight that patriots could win this war. In 1775, um, British did not take patriots seriously as an enemy. So two months after the defeat at Concord, British repeated their mistake at the Battle of Bunker Hill. So let's talk about the Battle of Bunker Hill. So by fortifying the hills overlooking Boston, Patriots hoped to drive the British from the port of Boston. And to retake the hills, the new British commander, you can see his image here, Lord William Howe, he ordered a frontal assault by his soldiers in the middle of the day. Now remember, these are the redcoats. They are carrying heavy packs and they wear bright red uniforms. And British men, as they went to attack, um, they marched right into murderous fire. So the question is, why did Howe put his soldiers in such a dangerous position? So you can see uh, a detailed map of the Battle of Bunker Hill. You can see, I can move this. Yeah, let's move it over here. Um, you can see the blue bits for the American forces, and then you can see the red bits for the British forces. Um, and then you can see this. Uh, artist uh, depiction of the event, the battle, and you can just see how bright these these coats are, and how obvious uh, how they are as as targets. Um, Howe wanted to win the battle despite giving the Patriots every advantage. His point he wanted to prove that quote that trained troops are invincible against any numbers or any position of untrained rabble, comparing colonists to rabble. So instead of proving Howe's point, the British, they suffered a bloodbath. They, um, they charged twice unsuccessfully. On the third charge, they were only able to capture the hill because Patriots ran out of ammunition. So technically, the British won the battle, but they suffered more than twice uh, of the Patriot casualties. But the Patriots really won a psychological victory. Because remember, Britain is the most powerful military in the world. So January 1776, about six months after the Battle of Bunker Hill, Colonel Henry Knox, he arrived uh, in Boston with um, cannons to reinforce patriots that were just outside of Boston. And Knox's men had hauled the cannons hundreds of miles from upstate New York. So you can see this map. They're going to come from Ticonderoga, and they're going to make their way all the way to Boston, these heavy cannons. So Ethan Allen, this man down here, um, so this is Knox and this is Ethan Allen. I love how Knox has the cannon because that's like epic. Uh, Ethan Allen, his militiamen, they captured the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga. So 
March 1776 with these cannons shelling both Boston and the British ships in the harbor, British abandoned Boston. So Lord Howe continued to pursue a misguided strategy. The British thought they were fighting a traditional European war. They believed the Patriots would surrender if Howe could defeat the Continental Army and then capture the major seaports, including Philadelphia, the Patriots' capital. But the British accomplished these goals and they still lost the war. So the British never fully understood that they were fighting a different type of war, a revolutionary war. Patriots understood that it was a struggle to win the hearts and minds of the civilian population. So instead of surrendering after setbacks, patriots, they kept on fighting. Thomas Paine wrote an inspiring series of essays called The Ameri American Crisis. And uh, leaders like George Washington would read these essays to encourage his troops to keep going. Meanwhile, the British hired um, German mercenaries. Uh, these are soldiers who fight, you hire them and they'll fight on your country's behalf. They're called Hessians. And Hessians had a brutal reputation. Patriot persistence was owed much to George Washington's leadership. Washington realized that to preserve his Continental Army from destruction, he could not risk everything on a major battle if the conditions were unfavorable. He was outnumbered, he was often outmaneuvered. Uh, Washington lost most of the battles, but what he was good at was a skillful retreat, and that saved the army to fight another day. So by preserving and inspiring his soldiers, um, Washington sustained them through incredible hardships. His army was small but committed. They were hungry. They wore ragged clothing. Um, and they suffered terrible casualties. By preoccupying the British army, Washington's Continental Army freed local militias to suppress those loyalists that were out in the countryside. So to succeed, the Continental Army needed aid and support from the civilian population. So throughout the war, women's work was crucial. Women ran farms and the shops, the husbands and sons went off to fight. The women made the clothing, blankets, shoes for soldiers. The British Navy blockaded the ports, so it made anything imported scarce and very expensive. A few colonists took advantage of the shortages um, by profiteering and selling in-demand items at very high prices. And another unfortunate thing was that Patriots caused inflation because they just made and printed paper money. And so the value of money decreased. And it also worked out for Patriots that if farmers sold their crops to Patriots, they would be paid in continental. So you can see there's a continental here for $3. So if a farmer sold Patriots um, their crops, uh, cattle, they would be paid in this paper money um, issued by the Continental Congress. And if the Patriots lost, this money would be worth nothing. And in turn, the British Army, they paid for their supplies in gold. So that was uh, very difficult to navigate as well. During the war, some women, they followed their husbands into the army. Um, they received rations. And what the women would do would maintain camp and do the washing and uh uh, make meals and such like that. A few women even helped fire cannons or they served as soldiers masquerading as men. Deborah Sampson, she won a military pension from Congress for her service. And Mary Hayes, she's also known as Molly Pitcher, she delivered water to troops during the battle at um, Monmouth. And legend has that she even stepped in and took her husband's place at the cannon. So women were definitely involved in the uh, American Revolutionary War. So early 1776, after the British left Boston, they decided to attack New York City and cut New England off from the rest of the colonies. So September 1776, Howe captured New York City after winning a series of battles. There were about 30,000 British and German troops that nearly crushed the poorly maintained Continentals. George Washington was forced to retreat um, back to uh, New Jersey, and he saved his army and the revolution by counterattacking. 
Um, Washington crossed the Delaware River in the middle of Christmas night. You might recognize the painting up here on top. Um, and so Continental surprised a garrison of more than a thousand German mercenaries. This is called the Battle of Trenton. It took place on the day after Christmas, December 26, 1776. It was a modest um, patriot victory, but it really raised the spirits of the troops um, and supporters at a critical moment when troops are cold and hungry and feeling uh, like they just can't make it. Washington began the year 1777 with another victory. So it took place on January 3rd, 1777. He moved his troops again at night. It's called the Battle of Princeton. And the Patriots inflicted heavy casualties on General Charles Cornwallis's troops. And so for the rest of the year uh, of 1777, Washington suffered more defeats. By the fall of 1777, um, the Patriots lost their capital, uh, Philadelphia, to Howe's army. Another British army marched from Canada to invade New York's Hudson Valley. This um, group was led by General John Burgonia. And Burgonia fell into a Patriot trap at Saratoga on September 19, 1777. Um, by October 1777, Burgonia surrendered. And this was the greatest Patriot victory yet. And Saratoga was like that hint that just maybe the U.S. might win this war. The victory at Saratoga was important. It encouraged France to recognize American independence and to enter the war. France welcomed the opportunity to weaken their old enemy, Great Britain. And during the early years of the war, France doubted that these patriots could even win this war. And so France was not willing to risk an open alliance. And so France limited their assistance to secretly shipping arms and ammunition, and this would keep the Patriot Army alive and fighting. Um, the French also sent volunteers like the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, he was a Patriot general, and he, had, um, he was an expertise in military strategy. After Sar Saratoga, the French said, okay, Patriots, we will, we will risk an open alliance with you. So February, February 1778, uh, there was a negotiation between Benjamin Franklin and the French. And this alliance reflected really the diplomatic genius of Benjamin Franklin. He was the leading American negotiator in Paris. And he was just really smart and strategic, Benjamin Franklin was. He, while in France, uh, trying to get France to be an ally of the early Americans, um, he became very popular in France. And he presented, he would go in public, and he would present himself as a simple American who just loved the French. And so after this point, after February 1778, the French army and navy began attacking British. And so this is the point where the war becomes more equal. The first joint operations between French and Patriots working together, they failed miserably, and the alliance would produce the biggest victory of the war in 1781. 1779, the British suffered another blow. Spain entered the war as a French ally. The Spanish also wanted to weaken their friends, not uh, the British Empire. Spain really feared that American independence would inspire their own colonists to get this idea of natural rights and to rebel against Spanish rule. So Spain was not an official ally. They were just an ally of France. And France and the Patriots were officially allies. Hope that makes sense. So the Spanish governor of Louisiana, his name was Bernardo de Galvez, he provided money and supplies to Patriots. And he and his forces were also able to prevent British ships from entering the Mississippi River at New Orleans. And this is, Mississippi River is a very, very important part of our geography. 1777 to 1778 in Pennsylvania, Washington's army spent a harsh and hungry winter at uh, Valley Forge, which is right outside Philadelphia. Soldiers, they didn't have uh, food or supplies. 
Washington reported to Congress that nearly one third of his soldiers didn't have a coat or a pair of shoes. Um, he says, unless some great change suddenly takes place, this army must inevitably be reduced to one or other of these three things, starve, dissolve, or disperse in order to obtain subsistence in the best manner they can. So that's right before Christmas 1777. Despite their hardships, Patriot soldiers improved from careful drilling by a supervised and, and were supervised by a German volunteer named Baron von Steuben. He came from Germany to help the Patriots. So June of 1778, the British evacuated the capital, Philadelphia. Uh, the British retreated across New Jersey um, back to New York City. And on the way, the British fought off Washington's pursuit at Monmouth, New Jersey. And this is a, a battle where Continental soldiers really just demonstrated their improved discipline under fire. So despite having won most of the battles, the British had little to show for it beyond their headquarters in New York City. Despairing of winning in the North, the British turned their attention elsewhere. So defying the proclamation of 1763, um, was a huge issue. Remember, the proclamation is this red line where the British Crown said, colonists, you need to stay on the darker part, and this is for American Indians, right? So the early 1770s, colonists disregarded the proc proclamation, and they started to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. That's west of this, this red line. So this led to an outbreak of war between colonists and the British it escalated the frequent skirmishes between settlers and American Indians. And this led the settlers to claim even more American Indian lands. And frontier war was especially destructive. Most American Indians sided with the British because the British promised to keep the colonists in the West. Sorry, in the East. <laughs> Sorry. 1777, with the British urging... American Indians increased, increased their attacks on colonial settlement, settlements. Meanwhile, white settlers increasingly attacked and killed neutral American Indians, or they just disregarded truces. And this is going to start a cycle of revenge that's going to continue for years. In the Northwest, Colonel George Rogers Clark, he led the British militia in the fight against the British. Spring of 1778, um, Clark took the settlements of Kekaskia uh, and Cahokia. Later in the summer of 1778, Clark's 175 soldiers and their French settler allies, they captured all the British posts in the area that would become later Indiana and Illinois. The British and their American allies responded a few months later. They recaptured a fort at Vincennes, Indiana. Clark's men, all unpaid volunteers, they quickly rallied, marching from their winter quarters on the shores of the Mississippi River. By late February 1779, they reached Vincennes and convinced many American Indians to abandon their British allies, and this allowed Patriots to recover the fort. At the war's end, the Patriot outposts allowed Americans to lay claim to the Ohio River Valley. 1779, in upstate New York, American Indian and British forces attacked several frontier outposts. In return, Patriot troops burned 40 Iroquois towns, and they destroyed um, the power of the Iroquois Federation. But American Indians continued to attack settlers with deadly effect, forcing many of them to return east. Now, as the war continued, British expected Loyalist support in the South, especially among the farmers of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. But the British, they wasted this support by continuing their misguided strategy. Instead of supporting Loyalist militias, the British continued to wage a conventional war. In the South, just like in the North, the British won most of the battles and they captured the leading seaports. Late 1778, the British seized Savannah, Georgia. Spring of 1780, the British captured Charleston, South Carolina, along with 
5,000 Patriot soldiers. So just as the British began their offensive in the south, Spanish forces under Bernardo de Galvez, they made key attacks on British forts in the Gulf region, the Gulf of Mexico region. They captured in 1780 um, the British fort at Mobile, Alabama, and they uh, took Pensacola, the capital of British West Florida. And so these moves were intended to solidify Spanish power in North America, but they also diverted the British troops from the offense against the Patriots. Because remember, Spain and the Patriots were not officially in an alliance. Despite winning major battles, the British failed to control the southern countryside. Revolution became a brutal civil war between Patriot and Loyalist militias. Both sides plundered and killed civilians. A German officer in the British service said this, This country is a scene of the most cruel events. Neighbors are on opposite sides. Children are against their fathers. October 1780, Kings Mountain, South Carolina. Patriots crushed a Loyalist militia and executed many of the prisoners. As Loyalists lost men and territory, neutral civilians, they swung over to the Patriot side. Increasingly, they blamed the British troops for bringing chaos into their lives. One disgusted loyalist explained to a British officer, the lower sort of people who were originally attached to the British government have suffered so severely and been so frequently deceived that Great Britain has now a hundred enemies where it had one before. So as the countryside became sympathetic to the patriots, General Cornwallis became frustrated. Continental Army in the South, it was small, but it was led by, led by two superb um, commanders, Nathaniel Green and Daniel Morgan. Um, early 1781, the Continental Army inflicted heavy losses on the British at the battles of Cowpens in South Carolina and Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina. And these these two events thwarted um, a Cornwallis's attempt to take the Carolinas, and so Cornwallis marched north into Virginia, and he was taking his troops directly into a trap. Dun, dun, dun. So although it seemed unlikely at the start, Patriots ultimately won the war for four big reasons. Number one, the British made tactical mistakes because they initially misunderstood um, and un uh, underestimated the Patriots. Number two, the British misunderstood the political nature of this war. Number three, Patriots were highly motivated and they benefited from George Washington's shrewd leadership. And number four, Patriots re received critical assistance from France. So late summer, 1781, Washington boldly and rapidly marched most of his troops south. The plan was to trap Cornwallis' army at Yorktown, Virginia. So for the plan to work, Washington needed a French fleet of ships to arrive at the right moment to prevent the British Navy from evacuating their army by sea. So Washington thought that a French fleet was on its way but he couldn't be certain when it would arrive because remember, this is the time of, of letters. <laughs> so the French fleet of ships, they arrived at the just right moment. They blocked the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. They trapped the British Navy. So this coordination was an incredible stroke of luck for Patriots. October 19th, 1781, the British are trapped by land and sea, so Cornwallis surrendered his army of 8,000 troops at Yorktown. The French had made the critical difference. So at Yorktown, the French soldiers and sailors outnumbered Washington's American soldiers. So thank you, friends. So the loss of 8,000 soldiers was a crushing blow to the British war effort after seven years of fighting. From 1776 to, 18, to 1782, seven years. Um, the British public back in, in England, they were tired of uh, heavy casualties. 
and they were tired of heavy taxes that they were paying for this war. Because remember, it's right on top of the French and Indian War. So early 1782, there is a new administration that came to power in England, and they were determined to make peace. So an American delegation that included Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, they negotiated a favorable, favorable treaty with the British. So 1783, it's called the Treaty of Paris. Uh, in this treaty, American independence is recognized. And the, the Americans are granted generous boundaries um, to the United States. So at the negotiating table, Benjamin Franklin, he secured far more territory than the Patriots had actually won. Remember, the proclamation went down the Appalachian Mountains. And so what the United States includes is all these pink bits. Um, so by making a separate peace with the British, Americans unfortunately strained their alliance with the French. The French actually thought they would control the negotiations. And so France and Spain each had to negotiate treaties with Britain. So you can see here's the Treaty of Paris. And you can see here are the um, pre-war boundaries of the British. And then now here you have the United States as this read here in 1783. You can also see over here this stuff with Russia. We'll talk about that soon. But you can see how close Russia is to the United States. But we'll talk about that later. Here's a great cartoon, Blessed Are the Peacemakers. The crown, king, and led by the Pope. Ah, of course, tobacco. Yeah, anyway. Let's keep going. So by 18th century standards, the 1700s, American Revolution was really, really radical. For the first time ever, an overseas colony of a European empire, they escaped control of that empire, and they created a Republican Union. And this was always dismissed as not possible um, and as a dangerous fantasy. So by defying the conventional wisdom of their time, patriots began an enormous experiment, um, hang on, no, right. an enormous experiment uh, aimed at creating a more open and equal society. Here I am. Patriots promised liberty and opportunity to people. Um, and some Americans, they won more than others. The greatest winners, I hate saying it like that, were white patriot men that had at least modest property. Um, they secured political rights and economic benefits with Western expansion. And the groups that lost the most were those that were loyal to England, the Loyalists, and American Indians. So the British tried to protect their loyalists by setting conditions in the Treaty of Paris. Um, but state laws and mob violence prevented most loyalists from returning to their homes after the war. 90,000 people, including 20,000 formerly enslaved people, they became refugees. They had nowhere to go. About half resettled in Britain's northern colonies, and many enslaved people they were simply just sent to the British West Indies and not granted their freedom. In effect, the American Revolution spawned two new nations, the American Republic and the future Dominion of Canada. American Indians were also stunned when the British abandoned them in 1783. The Treaty of Paris absolutely ignored American Indians, and this left American Indians vulnerable to expanding American settlements in treaties at Fort Stanwix of 1784 and Hopewell in 1785. Patriots forced American Indians to give up massive tracts of land as the price of peace. And then more settlers surged westward. So 1790, more than 100,000 Americans lived in Tennessee and Kentucky. And so it's, it's safe to say that the revolution was a disaster for American Indians. 
women gained uh, a few political or legal rights as a result of the Revolutionary War. They won respect based on the new concept of women as, quote, Republican mothers. Abigail Adams and Judith Sargent Murray are examples of Republican mothers. So this is basically the Republic needed virtuous citizens and um, those little boys would learn virtue from their mothers. And so this invited women to speak on issues that affected their ability to raise virtuous children. So men would be virtuous citizen and daughters would raise sons that would be virtuous citizens. So that's the Republican motherhood. It's also called the cult of domesticity. The revolution inspired some women to seek a larger voice in public affairs. There is a famous letter of 1776 where Abigail Adams, you can see her portrait here, she asked her husband to, uh, to quote, remember the ladies in drafting the Constitution. And although John Adams respected his wife, he dismissed her request, said it was ridiculous. Um, and this law reserved, um, uh, there were laws that reserved legal and political rights to husbands. Widows could vote only in New Jersey, but wives could not own property. They couldn't make contracts, as this was the norm in Europe at the time as well. Changes for African Americans. Um, slavery seemed to be inconsistent with the Enlightenment ideals of the Revolution. 1776, one of every five Americans was of African ancestry, and the majority of these people were enslaved. Most Americans, including some patriot leaders, they accepted um, slavery as natural. British and loyalist critics, they mocked patriots as hypocrites who spoke of liberty while holding enslaved people. In 1778, the governor of New Jersey confessed that slavery was, quote, utterly inconsistent with the principles of Christianity and humanity, and in Americans who have idolized liberty, peculiar peculiarly odious and disgraceful. The revolution inspired many enslaved people to demand freedom. Northern states, some enslaved people petitioned legislatures for emancipation, and they sued their owners in courts. 5,000 African Americans joined Patriot militias, the Continental Army, or the small Continental Navy in return for a promise of freedom. Southern states feared arming black Americans would be a threat to the slave system, and at least 50,000 Southern enslaved people escaped to join the British. The revolution led to emancipation in the North. Slavery was not critical to the economy, and enslaved people only numbered about 5% of the population in the North. Uh, critical is a hard term about the economy. The economy did rely on slavery. Let's not, let's not forget that. Um, but while the laws eventually banned slavery in northern states, many northern enslavers, um, instead of granting their enslaved people freedom, they just sold their enslaved people to, to others in the South before they could become free. So emancipation failed in the South. Enslaved people consisted of about a third of the population. And this was believed to be essential to the plantation economy. Maryland and Virginia, some planters voluntarily freed their enslaved people. This practice is called manumission. After 1800, Southern states passed laws to discourage further manumissions. Southern whites feared that freed black people would seek revenge for past treatment as slaves. 1810, about 20,000 Southern enslaved people had been freed, including 300 liberated by George Washington. So perhaps the greatest effect on the revolution was the spread of, of the idea of liberty, home and abroad. The statement that all men are created equal was radical when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson probably intended this statement to apply to white men. Um, but black Americans and women uh, repeated the words and uh, claimed these rights as well. 
Over the next three centuries, Patriots' principles inspired revolutions around the world. 1789, the French Revolution comes about. European Republicans cited the American president to overthrow kings and aristocracies. In the 19th century, independent republics emerged throughout Latin America. In the 20th century, Africans and Asians, they begin their national liberation movements. And as Thomas Paine predicted, the American Revolution changed the world. And there you have it.